as one was working with Deborah, but actually he's also a man of uh, significant individual and private opinions, which is what he tells me he's going to be talking about mm -hmm. today. So uh, what, uh, what he's going to say is, uh, is, is not the uh, government's line, as it were. Well, not necessarily, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> okay, so, so, so welcome to, to Henry, and he's going to talk for about uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, and there'll be an opportunity for discussion thereafter. <coughs> Thanks, Nigel. And uh, welcome. Thanks very much for coming, uh, giving up your uh, lunch break uh, for this. Hopefully, uh, uh, you will enjoy it. Um, so, uh, what the, the topic I suppose I've set myself is how we get to a place where almost people will do things that we want them to do, that they also want to do, and we don't have to tie them up and force them to do. Uh, and this is the, I suppose this is the uh, have your cake and eat it, uh, um, so that you can sort of both get the environmental outcomes and not actually have huge amounts of uh, legal uh, red tape. And actually, I always think about the fact that if you meet someone to form a, a business partnership and they bring their lawyer along with them, you know something's wrong. Uh, and the sort of fundamental idea that most relationships, most joint ventures or trying to do something, do not run uh, on the basis of lots of regulations. Um, and if they do, uh, you know probably you haven't got a very good relationship uh, at all. Uh, if you have a prenup, it's probably not a good sign. Okay, uh, and uh, this is where the disclaimer comes. Um, I'm actually... Uh, a research fellow at CCAN nominated by DEFRA, but my activities at CCAN are totally divorced from whatever I do in DEFRA. Uh, so my brain is sort of cut in many different bits, but let's for the moment say that there are two bits. One is DEFRA and one is uh, uh, a research fellow, and the bit that's research fellow is the bit that all views, etc. So they bear no relationship to anything I think as a civil servant uh, at all. Uh, and obviously don't imply any uh, views of government or, uh, or whatever, so, that, um, so that's important to know. Um, so, what is, um, what is regulation about? Well, um, I suppose the story we've had, which is the sort of starting point, I suppose, for an economist, and economists are, have been very influential people, is that uh, the big sort of insight uh, that they brought to activities over the last 30 years as uh, they became more influential in this area is that it's all about getting the incentives right. Now, an, an incentive sort of come in two ways. Uh, one is um, in the sort of more traditional area, the deterrence. Uh, that um, you know, if you get the punishment, uh, the fine big enough and the chance of people being caught high enough uh, they'll work out that it's a bad idea to do whatever you don't want them to do. And, of course, in the fundamental uh, economic uh, picture, they will look at the discounted cash flows, the chance of them being caught, the likely fine, um, uh, and so forth, and then compare that to the benefits of breaking uh, the said rule. Uh, in a, uh, another version uh, that's particularly, I suppose, prevalent more in the economic regulation area, then incentives are less punitive, but just about sort of encouraging people. So um, Ofwat, for instance, has a menu-based regulation, basis where there's different incentives, you get sort of different amount of money, depending whether you beat various benchmarks. It's quite a complicated process, I must admit, I've never quite got my head around. But uh, it's all about the fact that if you get those incentives right, you'll get the outcome. Um, and that's how you drive behavior, you get the behaviors you want. And that, this is the, the, the sort of, at least in a policy world, I suppose, the pervasive model uh, that we've been uh, working to. Uh, and what I'm really going to talk about uh, today, I suppose, why that model is inadequate and even problematic and, and possibly counterproductive. Um, and that is for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that actually, empirically, uh, that does not really explain what we actually see in the world. 
because the levels of compliance uh, with regulation in general is really quite high. I mean, when we consider, for instance, farmers, 200,000 farmers, uh, they probably get visited by the Environment Agency ooh, 10 to, every 10 to 20 years or something. Um, and even when they come, um, you know, the chances of the, 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 the regulator actually spotting anything, and then even if they did spot things, the chances of then, you know, them getting fined a lot is pretty low. They, you know, the, the local court probably has quite a lot of understanding farmers are, you know, uh, have a tough time and they haven't got a lot of money, so they don't get fined a lot. There's even a story which I heard from someone in natural England, which I rather enjoyed, which was about a health and safety visit to a farm, uh, where the, the health and safety uh, attempted to do a sort of spot check uh, uh, without the farmer being um, uh, aware that it was going to happen, rang up, and the, uh, and the farmer said, oh dear, my granny's just been sick all over the place, it's a disaster, can you just give me an hour, we'll clean it all up, put her in bed, and it'll be fine. In that hour, they went and got all the poisonous chemicals that they weren't meant to be done, hid it under Granny's bed, put her on top, and of course, health and safety turned up and never found anything. Moreover, after health and safety had disappeared, they went out into the, uh, the field or whatever and poured it all down the drains just to get one up, to get, you know, stick it to the man. Um, because actually, they were so, if you like, um, disengaged or uh, sort of outside the mainstream and felt that the, the regulator was basically out to get them, and so they'd get the regulator. And I suppose, interestingly, this is the, I suppose, the extreme end of what happens when you don't really understand why people really follow the law or not follow the law. The danger is that you end up with escalation. Uh, which is that because you get it wrong, you get the information wrong, you get incentives wrong, you get punishment wrong, the people at the other side believe you're treating them badly, you're anyway cynical because if it's all about censorship, why does it really matter? Um, the punishment, well, everyone's doing the same, so why are they punishing me? Therefore, I'm going to get one over you. And of course, when they start trying to respond, because it's this classic action and reaction, then the regulator says, ah, right, okay, we'll get them, so we'll include, put some new rules, we'll have some new... Uh, uh, ways of investigating them. We'll look at them more closely. There's even a story that uh, after the crash, in some banks, the regulator uh, stationed one of their employees in one of the desks by the other bankers to watch what they were up to. Now, just imagine, I don't know if people are in uh, open plan offices, but just imagine there was one person sitting there whose sole job was to watch what everyone else was doing because they basically didn't trust them. How would you act? How would you feel on a day-to-day -day basis that someone that trusted you so little had such low evaluation of your behavior that they felt they needed to play someone watching your every move? What sort of games would you play with that person? Would you um, put some super glue in their, um, their uh, uh, computer, for instance? I don't know, I can imagine people making little plans in the corner as to how they get one over on this regulator that was uh, watching their every move and had such a low evaluation of who they were as a human being. And of course, so that means that red tape can be seen maybe more as an effect of bad regulatory practice Rather than, as it's often, you know, it's often sort of picture is that regulators sort of get up in the morning, have a nice breakfast, and feeling bold and ready to pull out that red tape. Just how we like to do. It's nothing quite like that. Sitting down and writing some red tape, sending it out, you feel much better. What? Done that. But that's not the case, of course. It's all action and reaction. And this is the danger that when you don't really understand properly the system and why people do what they do, you have a huge risk of messing the whole thing up. So, why do people comply? Well, luckily, there are some theories to work with in different areas of the social sciences. Uh, and one of them is uh, procedural justice, that uh, if people 
have a sense that a, a set of laws or whatever are legitimate, um, and there are various sort of aspects there. Uh, respect. Um, do we do respect anymore? Is that something of the past? Uh, trust. I think, as you'll see, trust is a recurring issue. Impartiality of decision making. Um, and voice given to those regulated. Uh, and that, I suppose, also respect, uh, uh, relates to respect. Uh, and, and of course, the reality is that when we introduce new regulatory systems, we do go and talk to people. We consult with them. We have workshops. We discuss where they're at. We try and get a shared sense of what we're trying to do with the idea that when we actually, uh, this is a, as, a, as a policymaker, uh, uh, generically, um, when we actually come to uh, publish uh, the end results, we hope that people will think that they've had a say, they've been developed with them in mind to some extent, even though they may not agree with anything, they feel they've been heard. I mean, one of the key uh, practices, of course, with consultations is to respond and say, people said this, we thought about it, we considered it, these were the downsides, as a result we've decided why or whatever. So we try and explain, so we, we try and set up as a dialogue so at the end people feel that the end point is legitimate, it, uh, and of course, you can get uh, um, uh, things can get uh, put out of court if you haven't properly consulted and shown you've listened. So procedure is obviously is actually important. The other um, angle which is getting a lot of airplay at the moment is uh, coming from a guy called uh, Professor uh, Christopher Hodges at, at Oxford uh, University. Um, he is actually an ex-lawyer uh, in the city. Uh, he's been an academic for the last 10 years and wrote a, uh, a very big book, uh, about 800 pages, uh, covering a whole range. He looked at a, a whole range of sectors uh, and regulatory practice in them and looked at the evidence for the effectiveness or otherwise of uh, deterrence uh, and incentives uh, and tracked all the problems uh, with uh, the, the sort of feedback when you approach things using uh, incentives and deterrence. Uh, and he sort of turned it around and said, firstly, you have to start from the assumption that people are ethical. Um, and therefore, uh, if they're not following the law, you have to work out why. Uh, you don't just sort of change the incentives or um, uh, change or put the deterrence up. You actually try and talk to them work out what's going on and what the issues are, and relationships are key. Uh, now, that's quite interesting because relationships are actually quite expensive things to have. And it was noticeable that uh, one regulator uh, who we had at an, an event recently, one of their key problems is they didn't really know who they regulated. So if you're going to have a relationship with certain people, you don't know who they are. Uh, that's not a very good start. So uh, having relationships, uh, and you can see the sort of relationship that there's, you know, if you have a voice, if you've other people have a voice, then there's some sort of relationship. You're listening, you're communicating to them. Um, and I suppose the, the ethical angle, though, I suppose w w is a key element that uh, uh, Chris Hodges uh, brings to it. And that idea of ethical business relation regulation that's uh, come out of that has now got a level of uh, status that um, the Scottish executive um, are... Uh, doing pilot uh, studies using uh, his approach. And actually, if he looks at a lot of regulators, in practice, that's quite what they, what they actually do. So there's, a, there's an interesting situation where maybe the, the theory has become detached, in a sense, from the reality, and maybe undermining the reality. He also tracks the economic regulators, and as you'd expect, economic regulators tend to keep more to the sort of eth economic theoretical space, if you like, but he shows how a lot of them has, on impact with reality, have morphed in terms of uh, their approach. Uh, um, the, the, the exception he reckons to that is the, the CMA, uh, the Competition uh, something Authority. Sorry? Markets. Competition and Markets Authority, that's it. And, and his thesis there is that they're, because they're at some distance uh, in that they're sort of, they uh, look at other people, they're not a sort of direct interface with people, they have managed to sort of keep more of a, the, the theoretical framework, if you like. Um, and, but they all they are, they are uh, shifting as well. So these are the sorts of elements coming through, I suppose, in the in the literature uh, and being seen actually in practice. Um, 
And when you look at the sort of issue with environmental regulation in the area that I'm looking at, which is uh, catchment, the sort of idea, the model that there is a body, the regulator, regulating someone else to do something, doesn't really match the reality, because actually what's more the case is you've got a complex system of different players that maybe have different uh, interacting responsibilities, um, and a lot of it is about particular uh, collaboration. Uh, and, and I think that is quite likely to be more the case going through. So when you have uh, catchment-based solutions, when you have water companies um, seeking to fund farmers to help meet uh, <coughs> environmental quality uh, standards, you've got a number of parties that need relationships. So it becomes quite uh, complicated. You also, uh, the environmental NGOs um, come into picture in terms of whether they support or criticize or, or uh, uh, and so on. There's, Quite often the relationships between the environmental NGOs and the farmers can be quite important in terms of credibility and legitimacy. Um, I've been at various meetings uh, in places with uh, farmers and um, the sort of remarks are, well, the environmental NGOs, they don't have a proper job. They have their meetings during the day um, when we're actually working. Um, uh, there's, you can see there's quite interesting culture clashes uh, and, in a sense, actually, a very different perspectives on what protecting the environment really means. Uh, and when, if you're trying to have catchment collaboration, actually having a shared view of what protecting the environment means is, you know, it's quite important. So the sort of model of that sort of linear regulator, get the incentives right, get someone else to do something, I don't think sort of fits this complex interaction uh, of, of actors in a catchment. Uh, and probably the more you, you move to catchment management approaches, the less it does. So the interesting question is, how does collaboration work? Um, and that's just for light entertainment. Obviously, um, there's good and bad collaboration, and, and it's something about maybe working together and not just sitting at the edge and <laughs> watching the other people uh, fail. And um, the sort of ideas in terms of what people have used to try and understand collaboration, and one of the, the standard ones is game theory, uh, which is a comes out of the economics uh, profession and maintains some of the key sort of assumptions uh, in economics of rationality and individual um, optimization. And, um, and suggests that the basic idea there is that if you keep playing a game or you play it for a number of times, after a bit you realize that uh, you sort of learn from the game, so you start collaborating because uh, if you don't, you, you get worse outcomes. But in that sort of theoretical space, you actually have to play the game quite a few times um, uh, before you get to a, a sort of collaborative space. Uh, and that is actually, that sort of theoretical uh, idea is the sort of off what, uh, uh, I mean, if you listen to um, the, the chief executive, that's the sort of thing she talks about, but uh, it's actually an on, the fact that all the water companies are on in a sort of continuing game means that they tend to collaborate because they know the game's going to continue, and at one point, if they don't, they'll get caught out. But actually, in reality, um, people collaborate much more than that again. So it doesn't really capture the fact that uh, you know, people make certain judgments, say, about people or organizations that they just trust them at the beginning. They don't wait till they sort of, they might, if they find down the track someone does something, they might, the trust might be undermined. They might decide, oh, well, wait a moment, this is a dodgy character. But we tend to frame people from whatever, you know, you're a civil servant, and I'm a civil servant, or civil servants are trustworthy sort of chaps. We, we go into a meeting and we expect to collaborate with us. We don't go in and say, oh, I wonder what sort of person this might be. I better um, play a few games with them over the next few years before I really decide whether they're sort of trustworthy. Um, so, and also, if you imagine that all interactions in society had to wait for people to have played a number of games to decide whether they actually trust anyone, I mean, the costs would be outrageous in terms of, you know, you'd have to have about 10 meetings before anyone agreed to uh, actually do anything together. Now, it may be the case that in certain circumstances when you're not starting in a trusting relationship or you have suspicions, then you probably do need quite a few rounds of meetings before you get to a place uh, of trust. But there are differing circumstances uh, as to how that works. It's not just that we're all individuals and we're all waiting, we have to play a few games to trust. It depends who we are, what our allegiances are, what our institutions are, 
who we are, what, where we belong to, how we see the other person. And of course, the downside of that is, uh, you know, racial discrimination, sexist views. There's a lot of obviously negatives that we don't trust certain people because where they came from or, or, or their background and so on. Uh, so that can work both ways, but it's still a fact that those those are relevant. Um, oh, this slide didn't quite work, but. Um, there's also, uh, in terms of, so how should we see this, uh, one of the key theoretical framework, uh, um, frameworks which seem to possibly capture more of this fact that we start in a place uh, is called team reasoning. Uh, and the idea here is that we as humans understand, for various different reasons, whether we're in a team game or an individual game. And, um, and there are various social markers or, or you know, traditions, relationships, so forth, that underpin our decision whether we're in a team or not. Once you decide you're in a team, and obviously you can imagine there are formal teams, but there are also people get together, they trust each other, and once you are, when, or let's say when you are in that team mentality, you're really trying to work together to find a win-win situation. If you're in a team, you don't think, ah, how could I get one over on the rest? If you did, uh, then you'd soon be out of that team because they would think, well, you're not a team player, are you? Um, and people who go in that direction and actually uh, defect, they feel they're not part of the team and are being, say, treated badly by the team, uh, are, this is a technical term, feel they're being taken for a sucker, um, tend, of course, to hide that to start with because once they admit it that they don't feel part of the team, they'd be excluded from the team. So it's about, the, the story is more about team dynamics and people feeling part of a team and working as a team or not, feeling that the, the dynamics of the team, that the game that they played in the team is, is being uh, maybe played for the benefits of one or two of the people. And so, I mean, if you look at the previous one on the, the, the boats going down, the, the people at the bottom, when they're working away, bailing out the boat, looking at the people at the top and saying, this doesn't look like a, a team to me. But a lot of that uh, theory is around individuals in a team. And what we're going to talk about more in the case of the water sector is organizational interactions and um, the basis of whether people trust people in different organizations and also more broadly in different institutions. And here institution is used in quite a technical sense in not, I mean quite often people think institution equals organization. Um, but Institutional technically means uh, a set of rules that people all adhere to, with probably a set of shared values. Uh, it's more like a sort of club uh, or a profession or a religion. Um, actually, also people, this is argued about a, a language, is often thought as, a, as an institution. It's a set of rules about communication that a set of people share, but I think there's differing views on that. But being polite, saying please and thank you, that's an institution. So being part of an institution with a shared set of uh, values and practices and so forth, um, that is understood to be important in terms of trust because, I mean, there is an argument to say that the reason why Christianity, uh, uh, Islam and other sort of so-called modern religions have been so successful is not because of, um, that, in a sense, I have a, a, you know, not necessary to do with whether there is a God or not, but more to do with the fact that actually it's a great way of reducing transaction costs, relational transactional costs in business. Uh, I mean, you can see that also. I mean, some of the most successful uh, business entrepreneurs have come from a particular strong institutional um, uh, group. Um, uh, the um, Jewish uh, uh, success, it, it's, uh, can we put down to that? Also, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Quakers. Uh, a lot of the big uh, industrial entrepreneurs uh, in Britain were all Quakers. Uh, so being part of a group means you, you immediately lower those transactional uh, relationship issues. You immediately are in a trust relationship. If you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. You're a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. Immediately it gets us on the point where we can trust. If we can trust, the costs of coming to agreement, having an economic transaction, having any transaction you like, hugely reduced. And, and it could be said that the move to bigger cities where suddenly you have to spend a lot of time with strangers means that suddenly having those social technologies, if you like, on which to base trust and reduce transaction costs were absolutely essential uh, for success. Whereas if you live in a small village, you never run anyone, so you, know, you don't need that. 
Uh, so one of the sort of, uh, uh, some of the literature says that there's been a lot of emphasis on the sort of game theory and continuous games, but not actually looking in, uh, in depth at this question of uh, the origins of trust. And I suppose um, that is where this research is sort of, um, um, comes from, because of course, there's a problem here with trust, is how do you know when to really trust them? And it's all very well if you know what they're well, you're on the same, but you have to trust in all sorts of situations. And um, you can see that this is quite pertinent, isn't it? <laughs> Topical, even. Uh, though I think it's quite old. Yeah. It's going, been going on for quite some time. But uh, as you'll see in the water sector as well, that when you know people are looked, should I trust them, should I not trust them? Are they really doing that because they've got an ulterior motive or, um, you know, and so on. So it's not an easy space to be in. So the research that, that I did involved 15 interviews uh, <coughs> with a whole range of different players in the water sector. Um, it also, uh, and that helped me design a questionnaire, and, uh, which I put out and tried to circulate as, uh, as far as possible with the help of the water report. Uh, that great uh, journal covering uh, uh, the water industry to get it out as, as far as possible. And trying to explore this question of uh, how trust works as a, as a fundamental part of people being in a team or not being in a team. So, uh, key findings from the interviews first. Um, boom. Um, now, it's interesting, of course, that Offwat have picked up the importance of trust in the water sector, so their strategy is... Uh, called uh, Trust in Water. But the key focus of that strategy is actually the fact that customers trust that when they switch on their tap, uh, water will come out. When they flush their loo, water will disappear with accompanying um, material. Um, but what came out of the interviews, of course, is that if you talk about do customers trust their water company, so we go, well, what does that really mean? I mean, most people, when you say, uh, they'll probably say, oh, it's the water board, isn't it? Um, actually, most water companies, uh, most customers have very little, very few interactions uh, with uh, water companies. Probably, you know, to say they have some sort of relationship of trust seems to be totally inappropriate. They just don't know who they are. They don't, you know, it doesn't mean anything. They just get water. You know, they might get a bill, but what's that? Because, you know, there's no, there's no sense. It would be very difficult to say they have any sense of the nature of that water company at all, except what they might read stories every now and again in the news. Until, of course, something goes wrong. And then, of course, you can have an intense period where either they come out the other end and say, gosh, that water company, wonderful chap, they sorted it all out, they came down immediately, it all went jolly well. Or the bastards, they left me in the thing, it went on for weeks, they're a disaster. And, of course, how that also plays out is... And I read about tens recently, and they were spending, you know, paying millions back to their shareholders. And of course, they would act like that because they have no interest in what I do at all. Maybe, but it starts. You can see that that particular incident will probably get linked to the wider stories, or they must have written, or what someone said, and so on. But to say they have a sort of ongoing relationship, and, and the number of people obviously who have incidents is thankfully very small. And of course, the other thing is that. If you wait to find out that customers no longer trust water companies, it's a little bit late. Because one of the other findings is when things have gone wrong, the reputational damage due to that incident can go on for decades. People will remember that intensely. And there's actually very little water companies can do to do anything about that. So Camel, the, the Camelford incident in, uh, um, I think, I can't remember, well, Southwest, is still remembered, and it's, I think, it's 70. I mean, you know, it's still, apparently, it still comes up as an issue that people remember clearly. They're partly because they don't have any other interaction. They have hardly any interaction with the water company anyway. So if they have a, a really particular big event where things go really badly wrong, they will remember it. There's nothing to wipe it out. There's nothing to get rid of it. So if you manage trusting water, monitoring customers, you know that by the time the trust has disappeared, you go, oh, dear, then the costs and difficulty of doing anything about that would be, uh, it's likely to be huge, and this uh, came out. So as a strategy for monitoring trust, it's not very effective. You're using, a, a, a lagging indicator, uh, um, i.e., you know, when the whole thing has gone down the swanee, and B, something that's very difficult to do anything about. 
And that is, uh, I think, you know, a problem Ofgem had found, that uh, once trust breaks down, um, it's very difficult to do anything about it. Um, but also the other problem I found was that there were very much differing views about whether trust was even relevant to economic regulation. Um, that, well, we can, you know, of course we don't trust uh, the water companies. They're just trying to maximize the profits. Um, if we stood as a regulator in front of MPs in an inquiry and said, yes, well, that water company, jolly good chaps, we trusted them, bound to do the right thing, then, you know, we'd be laughed out of court. Uh, you're not meant to trust them. You're meant to be <coughs> trying to get them and force them to do. So, you know, there's a... Actually, there's a, it's quite, the idea of trust is quite difficult to do. And of course, uh, you know, because also trust doesn't really play a role in the economic theory which underpins the regulatory framework. So all the players are meant to be trying to maximize their, their profits or their, uh, their utility or whatever it is. So what's trust got to do with it? Though interestingly, the water companies do want to be trusted. Now you could say that they would, wouldn't they? But actually, they distrust off what in some cases, because they feel that off what doesn't understand what they're trying to do, uses very inadequate models to assess what they're doing, doesn't look in an integrated fashion as to what they're, what they're really trying to do. So when they are trying to be possibly public and spirit, you know, trying to act in the public interest, trying to think broader, trying to meet all the targets, they feel they're undermined by a regulator that A, doesn't believe trust has got anything to do with it, B, doesn't really understand or have the resources or intelligence to actually properly measure. So put those together, of course, you get increasing cynicism. What's the point of making an effort? What's the point of trying to do better, uh, trying to do a good job, when you've got a regulator that doesn't understand and doesn't really believe you're trying to do that anyway? And then on top of that, when you've got wider people saying, well, yeah, you're all in it, trying to extract as much value out of it for your shareholders anyway. So. There's not even a belief that really trust is relevant. Uh, some people do believe it is because they understand that actually trying to get stakeholders on site have to have a relationship, and especially if you're doing catchment management, but it's not really uh, sorted. And no one really knows what indicates whether someone is trustworthy or not. So ultimately, if a regulator had to stand in front of an inquiry and was asked the question, well, why did you trust them? They probably wouldn't be able to say or give anything that was, could be said in any way objective as to why they did or they didn't. And of course, the, big, the, the thing that came out a lot was the fact, well, investors, um, private investors. I mean, I uh, interviewed one person who was an advisor to investors in the utility sector. And I asked him, are investors trustworthy? And there was a sort of silence, because no one had ever asked him that question. Uh, he didn't immediately think it was a relevant question. Uh, to, to assessing, you know, there was no way you could say, you know, why would private investors be deemed either tr trusty or, or untrustworthy? It's just not relevant. And then we started talking about, well, what would it mean? How would you determine whether investors were trustworthy? And I suppose with water companies, investors, of course, have had quite substantial returns over the last 15 years. Um, and the reason has generally been because interest rates have been going down, so they've always sort of beat uh, the regulatory interest level that uh, off what have uh, uh, put. So they've always made you know, well above the sort of profits that in economic theory they should make, given that it's an, a low-risk industry. So what would, in those circumstances, a trustworthy investor do? Would it follow Osborne's dictum, uh, you know, repair the roof while the sun is shining? Would you expect them to have been investing some of those windfall gains, if you like, due to the situation, more in the infrastructure, more in back into the company. Um, and when he sort of had thought that through, he said, well, yeah, actually, they haven't really. Um, except the PLCs have done more of it than the private investors, which was sort of interesting because generally private investors in water companies, you know, the theory would suggest they're longer term, they're not uh, affected by the immediate short-term return, so you might expect private investors to do that long-term investment. Um, but his take, and, and obviously uh, this was just what he said, uh, was that he hadn't seen that. And it was actually the PLCs, if, if, if anything, that uh, illustrated that. Um, and again, I sort of illustrated that one of the sort of incidents that uh, people, uh, all, a lot of people talked about with the economic regulators 
was the time back in, I think, um, 2013-14 when uh, Ofwat suddenly announced uh, <coughs> that they wanted to have flexibility in being able to change water company licenses to operate at any moment. And that had been a huge, uh, uh, the water companies uh, had protested usually there'd been a big fight and in the end water companies had sort of got their way. But that had severely dented their trust and the suggestion was it was only when personnel had changed uh, that the trust started to be rebuilt. But it was still on a, uh, if it may be on an upward curve, but there was still some way to go. Um, and in terms of the future, uh, one of the sort of themes was that given that sub we've had an easy run in the water sector, in the sense that because interest rates have been going down, um, that has kept uh, the, the increase in, uh, in price in customer bills quite low. And when bills are quite low, no one's making too much of noise or protesting or, or whatever. But the future outlook is that A, suddenly we're getting to a, there's, there's been a level of sort of sweating of assets, if you like, in the water company. There's been not a huge amount of investment. I mean, governments wanted to keep prices down. And now there is a push for resilience, increased resilience. There's a more of a need to invest, maybe, something that's going to potentially push up uh, prices. And as a lot of the easy options uh, in terms of getting easy, cheap water uh, have probably been used, especially southeast, the new options are going to become a lot more expensive. I mean, ultimately, you know, things like desalination are obviously incredibly expensive things. So that, that that's going to put up pressure. But if we're going to have to innovate in things like catchment management and find solutions that are non um, traditional, if you like, uh, uh, don't involve pouring concrete, then that creates lots of risks because you don't know how it's going to turn out. And if you're taking risks, what you need is trust. Because if things go wrong then, and people just turn around and say, you know, that's your fault, stop it, and so forth. So if we're going to keep the prices down as such, water companies are going to have to take risks. But they won't be able to take risks and get away with it unless they're trusted. So trust becomes more important. And so those combinations mean that at the moment, if you look at the indicators of customer trust in the water sector, they're very good. But the question is, is that going to be the case in the future? And if you can't really be complacent, because as I've suggested previously, that indicators of customer trust can't really be trusted, because they don't really indicate anything significant, because there's no real relationship between customers and their water companies. So once start, things start going uh, badly, there's no real basis of underlying trust to which to sort of say, oh, you trust me, don't you? Of course I wasn't doing the wrong thing. No, they will come afresh to everything that goes wrong and possibly blame and the, the whole level of trust could collapse. So those were the sorts of interviews. Then the, um, the, the survey and 82 respondents So no way could that be considered representative at all, so um, all conclusions have to be uh, uh, taken with a pinch of salt. But it's not a big community, obviously. Uh, you can see that some people were better represented, and uh, I didn't use any techniques to force people in different sections. I tried to recruit more people when I saw that there was a lack of people, but um, it's sort of reasonably come. Of course, investors in water companies, they're not represented at all, which is sort of not totally surprising because they're, in a sense they're not really there or they're, they're, you, know, you don't meet them in the catchment you don't, uh, they are somewhere sitting out there on the, on the edge maybe um, and I couldn't get any of the customer representatives to, uh, to be in there um, but I suppose it was fairly clear cut that everyone agreed that trust was really important which is sort of itself interesting um, given that trust plays no part in the basic theoretical underpinnings of economic regulation in the, in, in the water sector, um, nor really in, stand, in, in the sort of getting incentives right uh, theory around regulation either. Um, and they thought it was going to be more important. Um, then the question of, I asked, and this is important, I asked well, who they thought was trustworthy. Um, and it's important, it's a very different question from who do you trust, because um, you might just not trust someone um, for very good reasons, or for bad reasons, just because you're not very trusting. Um, and actually, a very bad outcome is if you trust someone who you shouldn't trust, because then you get taken for a ride. So the question is, who do you think is trustworthy, uh, that actually acts in a way that is trustworthy? And the sort of 
results, I, I, I have a point of it. Um, you can see at the top level, we've got water companies, and they get the, the biggest in terms of importance of trust. And these are, this is the actual levels of trustworthiness people rate them up. So there's quite a, a difference between um, how important trust is and the levels of trustworthiness. And this is how important, how more important it's going to be in the front. Now, of course, in the future, I suppose these scales can't be quite sort of mapped on each other, but it sort of gives a relativity, whereas the quality regulators come out really well. Uh, in general, the quality regulators come out as very much trusted, and maybe they have to be a bit more trustworthy, but not a, a lot. Economic regulator, less well. Government, not particularly well, which is important to uh, uh, take note of. Um, customer representatives, pretty well. Environmental Jews, reasonably. And then investors, there you get this sort of total crash here. So um, suppliers, land managers, less important. I suppose there's still a level of de deviation. I mean, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the overall trust levels, I suppose, uh, uh, apart from maybe the, the quality regulators, not hugely high. Um, oh, I have got uh, those are two points. And then who trusts whom? Because it was interesting question of, is it that some people are not trusting other people, and there's a sort of, uh, there are particular people who are not trusting other people. Um, so, and actually quality regulators are both most trusted and most trusting, which is sort of interesting, that maybe those, you know, that people trust them and they trust other people uh, in terms of how they rate uh, other, other sectors. Um, and actually water companies, there's a particular, um, we have here, <coughs> this is water companies trust of the economic regulator compared to others. <laughs> so relative to uh, other people, uh, that was uh, seemed very low. Um, and the people who seem to distrust investors in water companies most are the environmental NGOs and the government. Um, and self-trust is high, but not overwhelming. So you might think, well, if I'm in a water company, I'm bound to trust other water companies, and that will be much more than anyone outside, and the same with any organisation you like. But actually, it's yeah, people tend to be reasonably trusty of people in their sector, but that doesn't sort of spin, you know, it's, it's fairly sort of even, uh, and it doesn't sort of jump out of you. Um, then what do you actually look to decide whether people are trustworthy? Um, and you'll see at the top, competence, competence, governance and accountability come up near. I mean, it is a practical thing, getting water for your tap, I suppose. For, so competence is obviously rated quite highly, it's technical. Uh, but then governance and accountability come right at the top. Uh, organizational leadership, so values, leadership, and right at the bottom, uh, the level of competitive pressure <coughs> they face. So, certainly in terms of the idea that, you know, the more competitive a market is, the better your outcomes and people trust uh, the results, that's certainly not uh, borne out in, uh, in those results. Anyway. Um, and how do you trust how do you uh, judge how trustworthy organ other organisations are? I, I suppose, where do you get your information? Actually, what's interesting here is this is sort of slightly, this suggests more in the terms of a sort of game learning from interactions of individuals, because by far the top is interactions with other people. Um, now, you could interpret that, is that about them in their personal capacity or how they act in their professional capacity? And I suppose, which is slightly different, isn't it? And I suppose you might, uh, I mean, there's a, I interviewed Yanis Varoufakis recently, and he said how, uh, when he was talking to the commission, privately, they'll tell him, oh yes, no, no, it's like that, but public, they'd say something totally different. So, in a sense, he trusted them to tell the truth in a private capacity about what was really going on, but not to say it publicly. So people can be totally untrustworthy in a sense, or, or uh, in, a, in a public capacity, while sort of <coughs> trustworthy. So it's, it's interesting, I think you probably want me to uh, look in that. The, um, Assessments of performance by regulators is up there as well, so that's sort of interesting. So there's, uh, most people did trust the regulator, except the water companies. Uh, I'm nearly finished. Uh, so this is the sort of uh, the, the conclusion, and uh, I suppose look at the. I looked at this picture for a bit actually, and um, I suppose it's the is it the, the the grumpy or the sulky boy who's sort of being told off, and uh, maybe he feels it's unfair. And being yourself is fine if that self is a pleasant one. But if it's selfish, rude, and troublesome, it's time for improvements. And in a sense, that was, for me, sort of gets this idea that once trust breaks down, you say, well, they're, 
we don't improve, we've got to improve them, we've got to intervene and make them better. But then the person who you're doing it to, of course, is sulky and rebellious because they don't think it's fair at all. And that's that sort of idea of rebellion. So keeping um, trustworthiness and being trusted is key. And of course, some organisations may be more trustworthy than others, but we don't, we're probably not very good at judging that or explaining it. Um, and the regulatory system that we're doing doesn't really look at that. Um, so it seems to be an important thing, but we're really not tackling it, we're really not getting a hold of it, and we really haven't got a basis even to communicate it, I'd say. And that's the fundamental issue, I think. But it's probably crucial, but we're really don't know what to do with it. I just quite like this um, the last quote. Just in the sense that uh, it comes back to this idea that, you know, if you're in a team all working together to change the world and make the catchment a, a better and more wonderful place, that's your project. If someone comes in outside and marches you into a room and says, right, there are various problems with this catchment, we're all got to get sorted out, you've got to do that, you've got to do that, it's a problem. It's a, but I don't, why am I want to do that? I've got lots of other things to say for. So, in a way, this is ultimately about the dynamics and thinking, you know, that maybe the ultimate goal of effective regulation in some sense isn't regulation at all. It's actually getting people to take responsibility and own the problem and make it their own. And therefore, you don't need to regulate them. You, you probably just need to support them, give them the right information, help them out now and again. You know, that regulation in some sense, if everyone's on the same side, is totally immaterial. It's something you have in the, um, in, in, in the, uh, the lower... Uh, folder and you bring out in divorce proceedings. I've only gone five minutes over. Thank you very much. And we have a few minutes for <coughs> questions. Um, thank you very much. Actually, what, what you've just been saying reminds me very much about uh, of, of the recommendations for how one is supposed to treat four year olds. <laughs> Punishment, uh, 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 you know, a spank is not usually effective in the long term. You have to get them to uh, empathise with them and get them to believe themselves to take responsibility. So we need to, to treat our, our, um, our, our catchment area <laughs> organisations as well. No, they were four years old. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm keen on that as a summary, but there you go. <laughs> talked about trust and that people don't really trust the government. I think that's possibly a fundamental problem. And that's why uh, governments are uh, forced to introduce regulations and new um, fines um, and things like that. But So how would you increase the trust in government? How do you increase that cooperation between, in this case, the different stakeholders? So you could have water companies, you could have farming unions, you would have customers, um, and, and then all the other players? Well, I think it's interesting that, that obviously the quality regulators are government, aren't they? But they seem to come out to be quite well trusted. Um, and there, I suppose, a key factor with them is that they're, they're close to the ground, they're actually close to the ground. Actually, interestingly, of course, environmental regulators can be highly constrained in what they can do and what they can't do. So uh, they you know, I would want to do this, but the law says this. So, uh, you know, actually they have disadvantages in terms of being trusted and they have technical sort of constraints, yet they seem to manage to be trusted. Uh, when people think of government, I wonder what, you know, mental, their mental picture, do they think of a politician who's miles away, who never listens to them, and it's all in their own world. So maybe that, I think, can be the power of a sort of catchment-based approach because you actually are down there, you're with people, you're trying to get a shared idea of what the problem is, where things are going, you know, and what has to be done. And that's where the drive, that's where the energy comes from. And maybe the question is the government doesn't get too much in the way of that uh, and, and try and control it too much, in a sense. But, you know, then it's a case of the design. I mean, this comes back to someone like Ellen Ostrom's thinking that really managing shared resources is about some sort of designing institution so that people in that situation are most likely to be motivated by the public interest. There is, of course, a downside to this, that the public interest for one small group can be different 
So the, the, the classic flooding thing, actually there's a story in uh, the first thing people do when they find themselves often flooded is say, well, if only we could get the water to run through quicker, we'll, we'll chop all the trees down so to, to allow the water to flow through the village quicker. Now, for various many reasons, that obviously is clearly a, a bad idea, but it's the, it, it, and people who do that say, well, we got into a team, we all were, we're trying to do the best for the village, we're all working together, it was very energizing, we chopped all the trees down, and, you know, so, but then they sort of learned that didn't really work, and then they realized that actually it was possibly linked to what farmers were doing up there, and actually they learned people down, where, where the stream were now getting hit rather worse. So there's a sort of learning process, and then maybe, you know, and having those sort of facilitating those relationships and understanding of the linkages and the implications. But ultimately you've got to sort of, to some extent, trust that people, when they see it, uh, will work with it. Because once you start going in and telling people what to do, then the whole thing, Collapses, so it's quite difficult. Uh, and of course, if people then you, you can get conflict, so people down the river start fighting and, and so on. So, managing that conflict, there's a lot of, it's obviously not a straightforward thing to do with, at all this. Uh, but I suppose the question thing, if it, at least if you know what you're trying to do, you can try and do it better. <laughs> if you haven't done, you know, if you don't really, if you try and do something else which actually is counterproductive and isn't working, then you're, you're, you're bound to be onto a, a loser or something. a lot of uncertainty at the moment about um, how exactly what the end result is in terms of freedom um, uh, to regulate, etc. Um, but I think a story I was told recently was that there has been, a, in a sense, a mental shift uh, amongst regulators um, due to Brexit in people just thinking, oh, maybe we can do things differently. And actually, it is not unusual for the fact that people's interpretation and the sort of common way people understand regulations does not necessarily uh, uh, actually match the regulations themselves. Uh, but certain understandings grow and they become common currency of how it works. So for instance, the Water Framework Directive, initially when it was, uh, the, the approach was developed by the Environment Agency uh, to implement it, was very much designed on the basis of catchment working, uh, uh, stakeholder led and so on. It then uh, sort of evolved, it, got, it sort of came out of the group that was trying to work out how to do it and came to a broader audience of the rest of the environment agency and they sort of said, well, we'll never be able to do that, that's impossible, you know, uh, let's just do what we've always done and rebrand it as the Water Framework Directive. Uh, and now we've come a whole way through where now catchment management is back in. So actually those different approaches have all happened within the same regulatory framework. Uh, so, you know, people's beliefs, actually there's something about suddenly being put in a space that says maybe we could do something different that actually allows people creatively to work out different ways of doing things. And of course, at the moment, there are lots of initiatives and people working in catchment to work things out. So, uh, you're not, I don't think it's that suddenly you've got people all going in one direction and they all sort of go in the other direction. It's just more that uh, the emphasis, the possibility, the willingness to uh, find space to do different things is maybe there in a way it hasn't been in the past, whatever the final regulatory settlement is, one way or the other. I was wondering if we could draw any parallel between the principles of behavioral economics that you're talking about and this quote. So uh, we know that people um, engage and sympathize better with having a discount of a standard price than avoiding paying a fine uh, above the standard price or getting a bonus paid after paying the uh, standard price. And perhaps the parallel with this is that uh, if I don't uh, comply with the standard practice by the, defined by the regulator, I have a fine that would correspond to a change 
done to me. But if I have a discount of a standard price, then that should feel like a change done by me because I follow and pursue that, that discount because people tend to pursue discounts better than avoiding fines. Um, I was just wondering if that is a parallel that... Well, this is going to be an opportunity to say, but I, I would say a lot of this thinking is not actually behavioral economics. Um, I think uh, behavioral economics has a, a lot of drawbacks, actually, because it starts in a place of fundamentally individual decision-making. Um, and it looks at so-called biases uh, from rationality uh, in individuals. Uh, and the fundamental flaw with that is, firstly, that rationality is impossible. Uh, um, you know, it relies on perfect information, uh, processing capacity of a computer the size of a planet. Um, and actually, everything you do, you'd have to sort of calculate and before you could do anything else, so you'd never actually do anything. So uh, it's a totally unrealistic model of decision making, which is recognized by uh, uh, most economists. So to define a new stream of thinking as a deviation from something that's impossible doesn't seem to be a very good basis uh, for a methodological framework. Um, what this actually draws on much more is uh, institutional economics, uh, which looks at the rules, informal, formal, the values that underpin them and so forth, and how those work. So it's more about interaction of, of people and how they behave. Uh, and one of the key sort of ideas there is actually uh, if people wear different hats almost. So the, the, when you're a consumer and you're looking at that discount, you are in an institution called being a consumer. And being a consumer has certain rules that have been uh, uh, taught to us very uh, uh, you know, carefully. It's what a good consumer does and how they behave and so forth. And so we are playing a consumer game. I don't think in a catchment management uh, system or regulation, we are actually playing a consumer game. We do not see ourselves in that. So to use that model and transfer it and apply it to the situation is probably, I think, not appropriate. Um, it can be quite useful, I think, in understanding how people, when they are a consumer, behave. But we have to realize that people are different people in different situations. They can be a parent, they can be a high, uh, uh, you know, a high roaming executive, uh, they can be someone playing beach pot, uh, volley or whatever with their family. They, and in all those situations, actually, they will follow the rules of behavior of, of, those, of that sort of institution they're part of. So we have to understand here what this is about is actually trying to understand the institution of, the, uh, of catchment management or regulation and how that works and how people see it. And in a way, by picturing it as if they were all individuals, you distort it and actually come up with the wrong sort of conclusions because you're not really, uh, you're sort of putting a sort of, you're not putting the right picture on what is really going on. Uh, and it's actually, there's a lot of evidence to say, for instance, in the, uh, you know, if you, for instance, ask people how much they value something. If you ask them uh, as a consumer, they see it in a certain way, they're playing a consumption sort of game. If you put them into a, a room with a lot of other people and they've got a constrained budget and they're thinking about, well, what's the, what's really important in our community, etc. They play, they have a totally different way of thinking about it because they're in a public arena hat, uh, they're in a sort of citizen space, if you like, and they view it and behave totally differently. Um, so you have to, that's why sort of thinking from an institutional economics uh, point is so crucial because that brings in the sense of the game people are in, the rules of the game, how it affects our things. One last question. I think we have time for got more than one Four or five people. I think, and are you going to be around for a few minutes afterwards? Yeah, yes. Okay, so um, let me go. Okay. Uh, you mentioned quite a lot of examples from the sort of uh, sectoral regulators who are regulating typically monopolies with few players. So I just wondered, would it translate to another sector, say food or you know, you know uh, <coughs> restaurants and that sort of thing? Are there th a vast number of players. Can can you build trusting relationships when there are so many people to to regulate? I think I, that's very interesting. I was actually chatting to the uh, the chief economist analyst at FSA about exactly that uh, that challenge that they have because they are thinking very much about this. And uh, obviously, they well, a they have local authorities who regulate at a, a lower level, um, and they don't know who the people are. And actually, it's an interesting question: Do they need to know? Because 
trust is not a, I don't have to trust everyone. If I, if I live in a city, I don't have to know anyone, everyone in that city for the city to work, do I? Um, and, and I think the thing is that we are part of a network. Uh, and if those, if the relationships, uh, relationships, relationships in that network are <coughs> trusting, then that can probably work. So it's not, for the regulator, the FSA, it's probably not necessarily important that they have a trusting relationship with everyone they, in some sense, regulate. But it is probably a good thing that they have a trusting relationship with a local authority. And the local authority maybe have people on the ground who have trusting relationships with a number of businesses. And it may be important that actually the group of businesses have some sort of relationship so they support each other. And, and also, if they've got some really bad performer, report them. So that there's a social structure and network. So I don't think you need to understand this as a sort of one-to-one -one regulator and regulatee. You have to think this as a sort of set of social systems that will either mean that people behave well or badly, uh, and you have to look at the whole system. And so there's, you know, it's really probably about, as a centralized regulator, you have to think maybe about your uh, relationships with the big players, and maybe encourage them to have relationships and supportive relationships with the small players, part of their corporate responsibility in working in the city. You know, you can do all sorts of things in terms of ensuring that there is shared belief in what needs to be done, a, a sort of shared team approach. But you don't have to be in charge of everyone, or, or you know, the, uh, the, the person who, who has every single relationship, I don't think. Thank you, Henry. Thank you very much indeed. Um, our next uh, SICAN seminar will be held here in mid-January. I hope you might subscribe to our, our mailing list so you get to hear about that, uh, or our Twitter feed. You don't have to remember who it is? <laughs> Do you remember Stefano. who it is? Oh, it's uh, Stefano it's de Erico from right. IIED. Right, okay, so we look forward to that. Um, let us thank Henry very much indeed for some really interesting stuff, and uh, we hope uh, that you uh, now feel that everybody tries to see you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. As I say, uh, Henry will, will be here for a few minutes.